Newsmax, the magazine of the eponymous U.S. conservative multi-platform network, carries a full-page advertisement for the presidential 1911 pistol, produced by an organization called Heroes and Patriots. This beautifully engraved and fully functional, limited-edition Colt Government 1911A1 semi-automatic pistol is gold-plated and holds 12 rounds. Its purpose is to unite with our president and show support for his policies. On the grips is a portrait of Donald Trump surrounded by Celtic scrollwork and thistles, honoring the president's Scottish heritage. One side of the barrel proclaims, make America a great agon, the other, drain the swamp. On top, America first, and, and fake news. The pistol, will become a treasured family heirloom worthy of passing down to many generations, it is not available in California or Massachusetts. The weapon is manufactured by Walther in Germany, though whether to honor the president's German heritage is, like the price, not stated. I cannot pretend it looks like a lovely work of art, but I am genuinely, unsneeringly impressed by a culture which wishes to celebrate its elected leader in this way. Imagine trying to do something similar for our politicians, the Theresa May strong and stable pop gun or the Jeremy Corbyn white flag. The only successful British version I can imagine would be a pair of purdies in honor of our future leader Jacob Rees-Mogg, one gun for each barrel of his surname. Luckily, the Rees-Mogg coat of arms distinguishes between the two barrels. The crests are a swan argent, wings elevated or, holding in the beak a water lily slipped proper, for rice, and between two spearheads erect sable a cock proper, for mog. The would be lovingly engraved accordingly. On both guns would appear the family motto, Cora P. D. I. I. Sunt, the pious, are in the hands of the gods, words, I think, from Ovid. The career of the new president of Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador, AMLO, suggests he is a populist. He jumps from party to party and ends up founding his own. He advocates price ceilings for tortillas. Disputing his defeat in the presidential election of 2006, he proclaims himself legitimate president, wearing a presidential sash. Yet the BBC, with the honorable exception of Justin Webb on today, avoids calling AMLO a populist, attributing the word only to his enemies, his critics call him a cheap populist. This contrasts with its ready application of the word to Trump, Orban and Salvini. AMLO, of course, is left-wing, and the three just mentioned are not. As someone who follows the news on Radio 4 at 6, 7 and 8 each morning, I notice that the bulletins begin very leftish and become slightly less so later. I assume the unit responsible, news gathering, works through the night from its default political position. So it relies heavily on the ready supply of news, from pressure groups, NGOs and right on charities, a new report warns that millions will die unless the government immediately injects £400 billion into X. A survey by an independent, Brussels-based think tank reveals that independent, Brussels-based think tanks believe that Brexit will be a disaster for Britain. As actual news gets going, this dreary propaganda is sometimes dislodged by reality. The Times, though much better at news than the BBC, has a similar remain or default. Its first edition on Monday ran the headline, 50,000 jobs lost as high street hit by Brexit and online rivals, despite the fact that the story mentioned Brexit only once, Brexit fueled inflation, and only in the fifth paragraph. In later editions, someone noticed, the headline became, High Street Sheds 50,000 Jobs in Battle with Internet Rivals. If you read the report, you could see that the cause of high street problems, as well as internet rivalry, was the rise in business rates, not Brexit at all. In June 1937, The Spectator carried a piece about the Ron Bruderhof, a Hutterite community recently driven out by the Nazis. The members were simple Christians, and could not, in loyalty to their master, give either the Hitler, salute, or fly the swastika flag. On the 14th of April, while Hitler and Lansbury, the then leader of the Labour Party, discussed peace, the community was raided by a small army of police and dissolved, losing its property. Exiled, it restarted as the Cotswold Bruderhof in Wiltshire. Subsequent events, however, doomed the enterprise. With war came the threat that the Bruderhof's Germans would be interned as enemy aliens. Some half-witted locals even suspected them of building a German submarine in their landlocked gravel pit. Their cause was pleaded by enlightened spirits like Wyndham Deeds, uncle of the late, Great Bill, Victor Cazale, Nancy Astor and George Bell, the Bishop of Chichester now posthumously libeled by his own church for unproved child abuse. The community had to leave, however, going to Paraguay and later to the United States. Its story is related in a new book by Ian M. Randall called a Christian peace experiment. I know the Bruderhof, because they eventually came back. 300 of them flourish next door to us in East Sussex. 
There they practice their plain, collective Christianity, with its agriculture and its successful manufacture of wooden toys. Their horse-drawn carts are to be seen in the lanes. They are good neighbors. I am glad the spectator noticed their troubles 80 years ago. Aged 190, it can be proud of its long understanding that religious freedom is central to all freedom. In these long, hot days, we eat our supper outdoors. It is light. One evening this week, I lay down on the garden bench and looked up at the still blue sky. Far above me, I could see a house martin gliding and fluttering in the currents. It was a particularly welcome visitor, because we used to have plenty in our eaves until sparrows vandalized their nests before they arrived. Since then, no martins have nested. Advice on enticing them back would be gratefully received.